I am resurrection and I am life, says the Lord. Whoever has faith in me shall have life, and even though he die, and everyone who has life and has committed himself to me in faith shall not die forever. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. After my awaking, he will raise me up, and in my body I shall see God. I myself shall see, and my eyes behold him who is my friend and not a stranger. For none of us has life in himself, and none becomes his own master when he dies. For if we have life, we are alive in the Lord, and if we die, we die in the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's possession. Happy from now on are those who die in the Lord. So it is, says the Spirit, for they rest from their labors. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, who by the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light, grant that your servant Mary, being raised with him, may know the strength of his presence and rejoice in his eternal glory, who with you in the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Most merciful God, whose wisdom is beyond our understanding, deal graciously with Mary's family and friends in their grief. Surround them with your love, that they may not be overwhelmed by their loss, but have confidence in your goodness and strength to meet the days to come. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wine strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all the peoples, the sheet that is spread over all the nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of the Lord. A reading from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. So we do not lose heart, even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure, because we look at not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary. But what cannot be seen is eternal. For, for we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, if indeed when we have taken it off we will not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan under our burden because we wish not to be unclothed, but to be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, even though we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we do have confidence, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So, whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in, in reading Psalm 23, as found in your bulletin. 
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus said to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Gospel of the Lord. Pray with me. Come, Father God. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord, you know the great love that we all share for your daughter Mary. You know the ways that we want to remember and cherish her always. Father, help us to see the ways that you love her and that you hold her forever. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And I'd like to invite the children to please come forward. Yes, Henry, that's you. Come on. Anybody below the age of high school? I want the middle schoolers too. Come on, middle schoolers. Don't be afraid. It won't hurt. Not much. Come on. All right. So I wanted to bring you guys up here. I do a children's sermon every Sunday, and I don't normally do them during funerals, but there's one thing I know about Mary. So some of you, she was Grand Mary. Some of you, she's Great Grandma. But she loved you. She loved kids so much. So I wanted to ask you, if you would be willing to share something that you remember that you really hold special about her. Just any memory that you have that makes you smile and and that, that you think about. Bradley, you're thinking of something. It's not easy, is it? What do you say? She used to bring you dilly bars. <laughs> That's an important thing, isn't it? How about you, Henry? She was really fun. Yeah, buddy, she was fun. Bren? She gave you advent calendars every Christmas. 
Yeah, raise your hand if she gave you an advent calendar at Christmas. <laughs> every, every kid she knew got advent calendars at Christmas. Nat? Yeah, always a Christmas gift for you. Yeah. You want to share? She would always give you lots of love. And that is the key, isn't it? Because I was thinking that I didn't know what you would say, but I knew you'd say a lot. And uh, come here, Brad. Come here, buddy. You want to sit by me? Okay. But that's what she did. And all the things and all the fun and all the presents and the advent counters, everything she did, she was always, always, always giving you love. And you know who else she gave love to? Like everybody. Everybody she met. Because that's the way she was. And it's very important that you hang on to those memories. Really important that you hang on to those memories. Really important that you tell the stories. You know, and you know, Bradley's a little bit smaller, so he might not remember everything as much detail as you two, so tell him. And Henry, you've got to tell your sister. You know, everybody try to remember all about all the love because when you remember it, you're carrying it in your heart. But I also want you to remember something else about Mary, that her love for you was not only a reflection of God's love, it was God's love working through her because God loves you. And you can look at your life in the same way and think of the things that God has given you and think of the things that God does for you and see that love and hang on to that love and let it shape you just as, as her love shaped you. Can we pray about that real quick? Okay, repeat after me, congregation, if you'd help out. Dear God, Dear God we thank you so much, thank you so much for, giving us Mary for giving us Mary and for all the ways, all the ways that she shared your love and we pray, dear God, that you would hold her forever and hold us too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, you guys aren't familiar with this, but I'm old and I need somebody to help me up. It definitely is if you win that marathon. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> All right, and with that, I'd, I'd like to invite Deacon John Motus to share his reflections. It seems to me, and I bet all of you, that the reading that I read from Isaiah this morning was so merry. Mary loved a feast didn't she? Fine wine, rich food, full of marrow, foie gras, morel mushrooms, prime rib, the fatty part of course, fried chicken skin. She ate the chicken but she really wanted the skin. And gravy, milk gravy, lots of it, in a bowl if she could get it. And then there was lady fingers dipped in real whipped cream, no cool whip, butter, real butter. She ate it like it was cheese. And then scotch, red wine, Camus of course, tawny port after dinner. She loved planning the feast. She loved inviting people to the feast. And she loved being right in the middle of it all. Mary loved meals at the dining room table. Set with sterling silver, fine china, linen napkins. But she also loved the meals served on paper plates. Plasticware, eaten at the kitchen table. The thing that was most important about our Mary was that people were there. People were present with her and Dick at the table. 
all together. Mary and Dick collected people. I think you all know that. Waiters and waitresses and cooks and people, service people, people from everywhere. They invited them into their lives. They cared about them and they loved them. That was our Dick and Mary. I think many of us forget that Dick and Mary haven't always been here in Lake Wales their whole life. We forget they had already had a whole life, a full life in Springfield. And I'll bet their impact in Springfield was very much the same way. It seems to us that they've always been here, doesn't it? The fact is, I don't recall a time when they weren't here. They were active in Springfield. Dickie had an automotive dealership, and I think everything that Dick did, Mary was right there supporting it. Golfing and bridge and lots of friends. They stayed busy doing charity work and civic organizations and members of country clubs and all those kinds of things. They raised three sons, Larry, Richard, and David. David, who's gone, had two grandchildren, Josh and Lacey. Great-grandchildren, Jackson, Henry, and Lottie. Yeah. Mary adored and loved her grandchildren and great-grands. I remember many a night taking a picture of Mary after dinner with her hot toddy just for Lacey. Yeah. One of the greatest privileges for all of us is that they adopted us we became their extended family. And they came and decided to spend those retirement years right here in Lake Wales. My family has been especially blessed that we were collected up by Dick and Mary. Laura and I had our first dinner with them over 20 years ago. They invited us to join them at a table at Harry's old place. They had a table we did not. <laughs> Laura and Dickie had talked a few times about the restaurants that they liked to eat at. And uh, Laura was at that time uh, athletic director at the Y, fitness director. And so she and Dickie had become friends, and, and uh, Mary and I had not yet met each other. So we joined them at that dinner. And I remember just, I don't remember what we ate, but I do remember it's the first time I ever had brie. I remember that baked brie. Then they adopted us when Laura and I both lost our parents. We became their kids. They took us in as family, and for 20 years, Mary and Dick were with us at Christmas, Thanksgiving, Easter, births, baptisms in Crooked Lake, yeah, weddings, and nearly all family events. And we had the good fortune to be invited to birthday celebrations, lots of them, yeah. And then Christmas banquets too, all of those things. Remember the Christmas banquets at the Lake Wales Country Club when Dick and Mary hosted? Yeah, we were the benefactors of that as well. They joined our church right here at Good Shepherd. My grandchildren and great-grandchildren got the privilege of calling them Grand Mary and Papa Dick, just like yours. And for years, I called Mary Mom. And she loved that. But it has been great fun over the years, teasing Brother Larry, because <laughs> I always accused, I said, I was a favorite son. <laughs> we played that back and forth a lot. <laughs> the point is, we are all gathered here today because Dick and Mary adopted every one of us, right? We became their children. And then our children became their children. Our grandchildren became their grandchildren. I have no clue how many Advent calendars that they passed out every year. I know the stack had to be huge. Tasha and Mike can tell me. <laughs> but every year, just before Advent, the calendars went out. I'm not entirely positive that the chocolate were still in the little doors when we got all the way to Christmas. But. <sighs> Dick and 
Dick and Mary took us in. They invested in us, and they invested in the things we cared about. Many times over the years, Mary would call me up after hearing about something that was going on, some project that Laura and I were working on, or one of our kids, or somebody that was struggling. Her question was always the very same. What do we need to do for them? You hear that? We. That meant us. That meant she and us. Because Mary was especially good at bringing people together. And she wanted people to be part of that cause as well. She knew and loved family. She understood. She understood that every single one of us were part of God's kingdom family. One big family. Her arms were wide open for everybody. Mary was very secure in where she would spend eternity. She believed and trusted in her relationship with Jesus Christ. Mary told me many times that she wasn't afraid of dying, that she was ready. She even teased sometimes when she would say, has God forgotten me? Why am I still here? All of my friends from the past have been gone for decades. Why am I still here? My response to her was always the very same. Mary, you're still here for our sake. It's for the richness that you bring to our lives and every person that you come in contact with. And that's every day. That gift happened every day that she was with us. In the reading that we heard from Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah was speaking to the people who were in exile. He was giving them hope of the things to come in their future if they were faithful to God. They would have a seat at that heavenly banquet. Mary has a seat. Mary has a seat at that feast. The feast that would happen at that place on this mountain, Mount Zion, the dwelling place of God in the midst of his people. It would be a fantastic feast with only the best food and drink served. Now it's Mary, isn't it? Doesn't that sound like a place where she would want to be? Her faith in our Lord Jesus Christ guaranteed her her seat at that table. When we talked about her leaving this world, which we did several times, but especially last week, Mary was excited. She was sad, but she was excited to be, to be reunited with all those people from her past, the ones she talked about so often. All those people that she loved through all those years Mary shared with me many times her concern for the people around her, those whom she loved, that they would be with her in eternity. She wanted everyone to be with her in eternity. One of the last things that Mary said to me on that last Thursday when she was able to communicate well, she made me promise that I would never give up never give up on those people she loved and her friends, that I would never give up trying to lead them to God. Now, for those of us who knew Mary best, don't we know that Queen Mary typically got what she wanted? <laughs> Amen. Amen. I'll never forget the way that I, my wife Meg and I met Mary. Uh, we were actually here for our interview in, in the prospect of, of me becoming rector of Church of the Good Shepherd. And, and, um, and there was a really a kind of a good introduction to Lake Wales, honestly, because uh, that search process is very hush-hush, very confidential. And so, uh, so we were supposed to be quiet about this. And, and so then we, we went out. You know, no one's supposed to know that we're here. And, and, and I, at the time, I was working for the bishop. And so, you know, if people saw me, then maybe they might start putting two to two together. And, 
And uh, so we went to La Encontro, you know, in secrecy. You know, now, today, whenever I walk into anywhere in Lake Wales, I scan the room to see who I know, and that's what everybody does, right? And, uh, and so there we were, and uh, here came John and Laura. And, of course, I'd known John and Laura as a, as a colleague in ministry. I'd helped oversee his ordination process and met Laura in that time, and, and here they came with this, this, this elderly couple. And, uh, and I met Dick and Mary, and I had no idea what I was in store for at that moment. I just knew that we had been kind of busted, outed, and, and there we were. But among the very first blessings that uh, we got from Mary, even before I ever had a, a meaningful conversation with her, was that we needed some temporary housing uh, because I had my wife and, and uh, several kids that were going to college in Orlando, and, and we just couldn't like, sell the house immediately and, and move down here. So we needed temporary housing for about six months. And, and uh, Mary made space for us in the uh, apartment that she, she rents from, rented from John and Laura on, on Crooked Lake. So that was pretty nice, you know. Your introduction to Lake Wales is uh, several months just sitting there looking at Crooked Lake. That was pretty cool. And that was a gift that came uh, through Mary. And then I still didn't know what we were in store for because once Meg got here, once we, she moved here, that's when the party started. <laughs> And quite frankly, we've never seen anything like it. I mean, we've been, over the last few years, we've been to many area restaurants and a little beyond with Dick and Mary. And it didn't matter where we went. What John said is absolutely true. You walk into the place and everybody knew her. Everybody. And it was the, it was the, the, the wait staff, it was the, the cooks and the chefs and the maitre d's and the hosts and the hostesses and the busboys. Everybody knew Mary. Everybody knew her. And, and frankly, the truth was that if you happened to be in one of those places at a time that she and Dick were there, there was a very strong chance that you were going to know her too. Because what did she do, Dickie? She'd start meeting the people all around. And um, engaging people at, at, at neighboring tables. And, and so what we found in her life, it was this ever-expanding project. And I had a, uh, one of my, my great friends and mentors was Bishop Hugo Pino Lopez. And he, he said to a, a woman one time, he says, he says you, you just don't stop throwing flowers. And by that he meant this was a woman who just was always shining God's grace with whoever she met. And that's what I saw in Mary, was that she just kept throwing flowers to everybody, everywhere, anytime she was doing anything, flowers of affection. And that got reflected one time when uh, she met our grandchildren, and as I recall, she met our grandchildren just one time. And then every Christmas after that, our grandchildren got in on the Advent calendar tradition, <laughs> and including this past Christmas. Um, now, and I want to be honest, okay, I think it's important to be honest in a time like this. Uh, Mary wasn't all unicorns and rainbows. You know, Larry's shaking his head. <laughs> Because the truth of Mary was that she also manifested love's stronger side, love's tougher side. And then while she loved to laugh and joke around, and, and, and you know, when you're having dinner with her or you're, you're somewhere with her, she, she'd stop every now and then and look at you and say, isn't just, this just the greatest fun? Aren't we just having the best time? And she needed to make sure that you were having the best time. But she also learned to find out that and she didn't put up with any nonsense either. And she was extremely smart. The, uh, she was legendary. You know, she would sidle up to the bar at the Crazy Fish and, and around you know, 7 o'clock and watch Jeopardy. And, and everybody at the bar would be amazed with how she would just tick off the answers one after another. Everybody's like, oh, you need to go on, Mary. Look, they're all nodding. You need to go on. And she was very wise. She had picked up a lot of wisdom over the course of her life. And, um, and, and, and she loved to invest in herself and other people. It didn't matter what your station of life was or, or, what, or even what, what your connection to her was. If she saw a spark in you, then she would invest in you. She would teach you. She would train you. She would love you in that way. As I said, she had a very keen discernment gift for character. 
She did not suffer fools or meanness or negativity well at all. If she loved you and she loved so many, then you knew that she saw the best in you. Not only the best in you as you were, but the best that you could be. And with that came this this unflinching desire that you did not want to disappoint her. And she also knew love's high cost. I think one of the great points of wisdom in her life is, as John said, the deepest of sorrows that love brings when we lose those we love. And that's what happened when she lost her son David as a teenager in an accident. And when we spoke of her pain in that moment, uh, anytime we talked about that, that time, it, w- it brought all of that sorrow to the present. It, it was a, as acute and as fresh as when it had happened. And so, in all of that, I know that people struggle with the idea of God. And as they're struggling with the idea of God, they, they could look out across the humanity's dizzying array of approaches to that whole subject. But a very good place to start is the simple proposition that the Apostle John noted, which is that God is love. Love is something God does. Love is something God feels. But it's much more than that. It is the very nature of what God is. God is love. Now, we can say that, but then we immediately realize that love is difficult to grasp. And, and how many times have we thought we saw it and then found out it was not quite what we thought? Or how many times did we think we were showing it and find out that we were falling short in some ways? It's, and it's difficult to define precisely and if, we, if I took a survey of everybody in this room, then I would suspect that I'd come up with a different angle on it from every single one of you. And we could expand that out and out and out. And yet we all, I think, would agree that love is the most important thing that there is. It's the most important thing that there is. If, If it wasn't for love, where is the meaning and purpose in life? And so uh, I'm sure you all remember from your school days all about the transit of property, right? Mathematics, your math is sharp. You remember the transit of property? The kids know because they just learned it, right? They're shaking their heads. (laughs) All right. If A equal B and B equal C, then A equal C. Right? If one thing equals another and then another, then the, the, they all equal. And so if we say that God is love, and we proclaim that Jesus is God, then what we come to recognize is that Jesus is love incarnate, love embodied. What does love look like? And take a look at Jesus. And so when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, then maybe a way to think about that is not how did he manage all that, but to consider how love is the way and the truth and the life. When we think about love, you can't see it. We can only see evidence of its presence or absence. I mean, I, I've watched Dickie these years, and, and I've seen how he, he manifested his love for Mary, but you can't actually see the love. You just see all the care and the nurture, right? And um, you can't measure it by weight or volume or length. You can't see it under a microscope. You know, and people that study the brain, they, they can explain how it's kind of manifest in the neurological functions of our brains, but that only explains what it's made of, not what it is. 
And we know that as we know that our physical bodies, even though we know all about their biochemistry in so many respects, that we are something more than just these physical shells that we live in. And so we see that in Mary. This great and glorious and grand lady, I like that Queen Mary, this woman who had such incredible vitality and power. And to recognize how much that vitality and power of her person did not diminish or decline even as her physical body was failing over these last few years. I mean, she needed a lot of help. I mean, I, sometimes I you know, would see her you know, in her chair get carried up steps, and it wasn't just because she liked the idea of a litter bearer, and, you know, that, unless she might have just chosen for that all along, if she could get it. But all the things that everybody around her did, I watched Dick load her wheelchair in and out of the vehicle to get her places to, to, to manifest this love. But when she got in place, even just a few weeks ago as we celebrated her birthday and then Dickie's birthday, she was holding court. <laughs> raising her glass. Aren't we having fun? Aren't we having the best time? And you knew when she looked at you that she was just so happy you were there. And, and that, that vitality continued even as her life began to shrink, that the times of going out became fewer and farther between, and uh, eventually to the point where she was living almost all of her life in her easy chair, day and night. She slept in it, she, she lived in it, she, she stayed in it all the time. But through that, throughout that, her mind stayed sharp, razor sharp. And her will stayed strong. I mean, you talk about an iron will. You did not want to dare the iron skillet. Not that she would physically wield it, but she was tough. And when she said what she wanted, she said what she wanted. She was in command and control right up until her death. And frankly, she did all she could do for Dick and the family in preparation for her death, in effect taking care of things ahead of time so that they would be cared for after she was gone. But what we see is that while her outer nature was wasting away, her inner nature was being renewed day by day, right up until she had wrung every last drop of life out of her 97-year-old body. And when she came to that moment, who was there but her dear Dickie? 72 years of marriage, an incredible journey manifesting their love all the way. And as hard and as difficult as it is to say goodbye to Mary, the Apostle Paul calls that a slight momentary affliction compared with the eternal weight of glory that love, because God is love, holds for Mary. Her earthly tent has given out but as Paul noted in his first letter to the Corinthians, love never ends. And so Mary will live on in our hearts. And after the service, you're invited to a beautiful reception that's been set up uh, in our parish hall right through here. But you'll see there's, there's a bunch of pictures that are laid out on a couple of different tables, so don't miss them. The pictures must be saved. The stories must be told. The memories must be cherished. Because we who loved her prepared a place in our hearts for her. And there she shall reside 
while we draw breath. God has prepared a place for her in his heart. And he's, his place is prepared forever. And love is her way to that heart. Mary pointed to it and shared it lavishly throughout her long and adventurous life. And so may we all, through her example, be bound to him and to each other in love forever. Amen. Please stand. Turning to the center of your bulletins. In the assurance of eternal life given at baptism, let us proclaim our faith and say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray, kneeling as you are able. And if you would, respond at the italics. For our sister Mary, let us pray to our Lord Jesus Christ who said, I am resurrection and I am life. Lord, you consoled Martha and Mary in their distress. Draw near to us who mourn for Mary and dry the tears of those who weep. Hear us, Lord. You wept at the grave of Lazarus, your friend. Comfort us in our sorrow. Hear us, Lord. You raise the dead to life. Give to our sister eternal life. Hear us, Lord. You promised paradise to the thief who repented. Bring our sister to the joys of heaven. Hear us, Lord. Our sister was washed in baptism and anointed with the Holy Spirit. Give her fellowship with all your saints. Hear us, Lord. Give courage and faith to those who are bereaved that they may have strength to meet the days ahead in the comfort of a reasonable and holy hope in the joyful expectation of eternal life with those they love. Hear us, Lord. Help us, we pray, in the midst of things we cannot understand, to believe and trust in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to life everlasting. Hear us, Lord. Comfort us in our sorrows at the death of our sister. Let our faith be our consolation and eternal life our hope. Father of all, we pray to you for Mary and for all those whom we love but see no longer. Grant to them eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. May her soul and the souls of all departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. Amen. Please stand. We now take a moment to greet each other in the peace of the Lord. So the peace of the Lord be always with you.
All right, please be seated. We're now going to move into the communion section of our service, and I want to make sure everyone knows that, that the tradition of the Episcopal Church is to invite all baptized Christians to receive Holy Communion. When you, if you do come up for communion, it will be uh, the, the body and blood, the bread and the wine are together on one wafer, and that's kind of a COVID accommodation that we've made. So if you would, those who want to receive communion will come forward and kind of come up the center on, on either side of this railing and use the railing, if you will. And then you'll take your place along the, uh, uh, the altar rail, filling in from your right to left. And then once you've received the bread and wine on the wafer, then please get up and, and return. You can kneel as you're able. If you're not able to kneel, it's, it's perfectly fine to stand. And then try not to run in people, into people as you come back. So, so come down on the outside using the railings on, on either side. Uh, and if you don't wish to receive for any reason, you're not baptized, you don't want to receive, just cross your arms over your chest and let you come forward for prayer. And then, as I said uh, in my sermon, after the service, there's a wonderful reception prepared for you uh, to honor Mary and, and to celebrate her life and to support this, this wonderful family. That will happen after we inter... Uh, Mary's ashes. She's going to be partially interred here at Good Shepherd and partially uh, back home in Springfield. So we'll, we'll be processing out the front and into our memorial garden, which is right in the courtyard right here. So I invite you to please be a part of that as well. Walk in love as Christ loves us and gave himself as a sacrifice and offering to God. And 
the joy we share as we tarry there. No another has ever Please stand. All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord who rose victorious from the dead and comforts us with the blessed hope of everlasting life. For to your faithful people, O Lord, life is changed, not ended. And when our mortal body lies in death, there is prepared for us a dwelling place eternal in the heavens. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we have fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. When he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Hallelujah. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. And feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
please pray with me? Almighty God, we thank you that in your great love you have fed us with the spiritual food and drink of the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, and have given us a foretaste of your heavenly banquet. Grant that this sacrament may be to us a comfort in affliction and a pledge of our inheritance in that kingdom where there is no death, neither sorrow nor crying, but the fullness of joy with all your saints, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds and knowledge and love of God, the Son Jesus Christ our Lord. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant Mary. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. Amen.